Um, good afternoon. On behalf of the McLean Center um, and the Center for Health and Social Sciences, um, uh, Dr. Meltzer and I are delighted to welcome you to today's lecture in the 2018-19 series on improving value in the U.S. healthcare system. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Harold Pollack. Harold is the Helen Ross Professor at the School of Social Service Administration, also serves as a professor in the Biological Sciences Division and the Department of Public Health Sciences. Harold is co-director, um, as many of you know, of the University of Chicago Crime Lab and the University of Chicago Health Lab and a committee member of CHAS, the Center for Health Administration Studies. Harold has published widely at the interface between poverty policy and public health. Uh, his research appears in journals like JAMA, the American Journal of Public Health, Social Service Review, uh, but also in uh, popular uh, press like the Washington Post, the Times, uh, the Nation, the New Republic, and so on. Harold is considered one of the country's leading experts on Medicaid policy. His talk today, as you see behind me, is Medicaid policies to serve severely disadvantaged populations. Please join me in welcoming Harold Pollack. Well, I'll try to live up to Mark's generous uh, billing there. Um, it's always, I, I always wish that my mom could be here to listen to those introductions, although she would add a few things that you, that you somehow left off about that seventh grade debate contest that I won. Uh, uh, the, um, I read the Yes. The, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit of a challenge to give a talk like this because so many of us deal with Medicaid every day and are so aware of the challenges that we face. And of course, some of you have, have seen me talk about Medicaid before. Uh, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the characteristic challenges that we see and uh, have a good conversation about at least some of the work that, that we do. And uh, so thanks so much for, for coming. The, um, so here's my roadmap for the next three hours or so. Uh, the, um, so I want to talk a little bit about the variety of severe disadvantages that people face uh, and severe vulnerabilities. Uh, and also how we've made actually a lot of progress in Medicaid. We've created a platform to really help people, but we don't quite know what to do with it yet. And it's not quite functioning the way that it needs to. To, uh, to really help people the way that we all want to. Uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on uh, SMI and the opioid epidemic, and also actually on the criminal justice population, where David and I have done uh, quite a bit of work in the health lab uh, uh, of late. And then I'll just offer some Polonius-like uh, pompous final bromides uh, uh, around 5 o'clock uh, today. So. Um, you know, Medicaid was, has been traditionally the whipping boy of American health policy. When I was trained uh, 20 years ago as a doctoral student, uh, it was, uh, uh, Medicaid was really considered to be the stepchild. This is a cartoon from the New Yorker. It says, is there a doctor who accepts Medicaid in the house? And that's one of those funny but not funny things that sometimes humor is a way to say stuff that it's hard to say straight up. And, uh, and this question about what are we really doing if we give people a Medicaid card, but the program has some defects, what are we really giving to people? And uh, in a lot of ways, there was a sense that Medicaid was, uh, uh, you know, was inadequate, it paid too little, had all, all sorts of problems. So you know, the concept of Medicaid as welfare medicine is, uh, is a very common trope. And those of you that have seen the recent debate about work requirements in Medicaid, that is largely about, uh, is this a health insurance program? Is this a welfare program? What is the social significance of being a Medicaid recipient in America now that 70 million Americans plus are receiving Medicaid? Uh, and there's always been this fear that Medicaid recipients are politically marginalized and that we're leaving poor people to the tender mercy of the states. 
You know, when I talk to people about um, health policy, and people often say, you know, we really should leave health policy to, um, to, to the laboratories of democracy across America. And if that person is over the age of 65, I often say, you know, let's ha how about if we do that with your Medicare and, and, and put the full faith and credit of the state of Illinois behind your, Medicaid, your Medicare benefits? And most people say, you know, that doesn't sound like a very good idea. And there's this sense that in, in the American social insurance system that we have always made a distinction between the truly worthy and powerful constituencies who get what we refer to as social insurance, which is often done at the federal level, and that we leave it to the states to uh, support groups of people that we're a little bit more ambivalent about. And, uh, uh, and certainly the way that I would have taught Medicaid 20 years ago would, would, would really emphasize that pretty highly, and I certainly today I would talk about that. You know, the low reimbursement rate uh, of Medicaid, the incredible bureaucratic complexity of Medicaid is a significant problem. The cross-state variation in what's covered and the quality of Medicaid, and also simply the fact that if you move across state lines, that you have to reapply for Medicaid. Uh, as I've, I've in this from this very spot, I've talked about my wife and I, our experiences taking care of her brother-in-law who. Uh, was a Medicaid recipient in New York State, and when his mom died and he had to move into our home, he was suddenly without his Medicaid because we live in Illinois at the precise moment that his mom had just died. And, you know, when you're a Medicare recipient, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, then there's indignities such as the $2,000 countable asset test for people who qualify for Medicaid uh, through disability. Uh, your, your, home, your family home is actually to a significant extent sheltered from this requirement, but if you think about the, how hard it would be to live in your home if you can only have $2,000 in countable assets, what do you do during the polar vortex if your pipes burst and you got a sudden bill? Uh, and all of the mundane ways that we treat people indecently, uh, particularly here in Illinois where we really rank quite poorly in, uh, in national rankings. We, you know, we sometimes talk about the blue states and the red states. And here in Illinois, we like to consider ourselves a blue state, but if that comes with a connotation that we offer more generous and competently delivered social policy, that would be a difficult hypothesis to confirm in the data, uh, uh, even compared to with some of the neighboring uh, more conservative states. Have I left anything obvious off of this list of Medicaid bad things? David? Mm -hmm. But a related but slightly different issue is sort of how we finance it. Because, you know, the reality is that we don't pay and when we do, we pay it in incredibly politically distorted ways. So I, I wonder if that really deserves to be elevated to the list of the obvious problems. Um, it, it, mm -hmm. It's a whole series of, of challenges in terms of you know, thinking you're covering things but really not, and the distortion of quality of other things. I think that point is very well taken. Uh, and so under the hood of the obvious problems are the not so obvious problems. By the way, another one is that, is that we also pay late and Medicaid is a poor payer. I've spent a lot of time talking to people in this hospital about why, how it would be nice if we were nicer to people on Medicaid in this hospital. And one of the things that people say to me back is, let's just talk about how much money right now, as you're asking me this question, the state of Illinois owes the University of Chicago Medical Center. And it's often a nine-figure sum. And that kind of kneecaps my efforts to try to advocate uh, within an institution where people have to worry about things like that. Uh, and uh, so there's a whole there's a whole variety of, of obstacles that... But in a lot of ways, I mean, Medicaid as a program is no less fraudulent than pensions. We promise something, mm -hmm. and then we go do what we need to do to do it. We choose to, um, you know, cross-subsidize it by design mm -hmm. in a whole variety of ways. You know, we allow laws such as the ones we have that allow the vast majority yeah. of Medicaid payments to be outside of Mm -hmm. Included in all this has to be some, some 
a measure of government dishonesty and, 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 and frankly, even advocates to prioritize service delivery over sustainability. Yeah, and uh, I'll put. I'll put a pin in that. By the way, I think that also varies across states quite a bit. And uh, you can have high quality governance with a very, a very uh, generous Medicaid program and high quality governance with a very penurious uh, Medicaid program. When you start to uh, want to have a blue state policy with red state financing, that's when you run into a problem. There, yes? I would just add to your list the lack of So now I can say, we, and I'll put in a, I'm going to acknowledge and put a pin in these points that you guys are making. We could have an entire, we could spend an entire week outlining more of these. Some of these, by the way, also apply to private coverage as well, because one of the striking things is if you ask, from, if you ask individual patients, patient satisfaction surveys, things like that, Medicaid compares surprisingly favorably with private coverage. And, uh, uh, but there's significant issues, which I would say 10 years ago, we would say are kind of decisive and relate to the deeply stigmatized position of Medicaid within the health politics of American government. Uh, by the way, one thing that hasn't come up that I do want to mention, one of the mo most mundane realities is just getting people access to basic services like dental care. Uh, Mark mentioned that I used to write for the Washington Post. I still write for them, but I don't have the regular column anymore. But I did a piece on dental care, and I just went up to the Heartland Clinic, and I just met a couple of people. And this is a pretty young lady that I met who uh, had a toothache. And she was describing how every morning she had to call at 6 AM to try to get into a dental clinic. And she was on a waiting list. And the one morning when they could take her, she was taking a test for an educational thing. And she ended up losing a tooth. And you know, it wasn't the worst thing happening to her that she lost a tooth. But I remember I was talking to her, and she kept smiling like this. You know, she kept her mouth closed, and she felt very stigmatized. And you know, she, she lost a tooth. And you know, it didn't have to happen. And uh, this is another man that I met the same day who hadn't had his teeth cleaned in two years. He's a Medicaid recipient in Illinois here. And he's been chewing on the left side of his mouth for two years. And the lack of imagination in our policy construct to provide basic services like this uh, certainly makes, uh, you know, is a real thing. But then we get to something else that's happening, which is the surprising political resilience of Medicaid and its position that turns out to be much less stigmatized than we might have thought. And in many ways, uh, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, Republicans tried to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, and that, been, and that effort failed. And, I'm, uh, and it's really striking how the popularity of Medicaid turned out to be fundamental to why that effort failed. Republican governors around the country, advocacy groups, many, many people, including people in this room who could give us a long list of why they're really angry at Medicaid, 
when the issue came up, should we block, grant, and cut Medicaid, people said, no, we're actually going to go, go to Washington and try to kill any politician who tries to do that. And it was really striking in a couple of different ways that Medicaid turns out to be an essential pillar for a lot of things, and it has some unexpected con uh, constituencies that people didn't really understand. Uh, and, uh, and I want to just lay out a few examples of that. By the way, that's true on both sides of the aisle. Is anybody familiar with uh, Senator Sanders as an advocate for single-payer health care? Bernie Sanders is a senator from Vermont. He ran for president, just to bring us all up to speed. The, um, that was supposed to be a joke, but uh, <laughs> the, um, please, the other guy says, please clap. There, um, there's a please laugh. So it turns out that Senator Sanders' single payer bill is not a single payer bill, that he has specifically carved out the disability components of Medicaid and said, I'm not going to touch that. And I think that was a very wise decision. One reason is we've had, since 1965, 50 states have wired up a way to take care of people with disabilities. And Senator Sanders and his staff widely said, you know, if we try to rewire that, Wow, we're going to scare a lot of people, and we're probably going to screw a lot of things up that people have figured out how to do since 1965. And, uh, and it was striking in that way. Uh, it was also striking how Republicans thought that if they specifically left alone the pieces of Medicaid that are designated as disability, that the disability community would would at least be permissive about a lot of the changes they wanted to make to the ACA Medicaid expansion. And that turned out to be absolutely the opposite of what happened. Every single disability advocacy group in the United States uh, was hotly opposed to, to that repeal effort. Now, part of it was that they were going to block grant Medicaid, which, which people understood in the long run was a way of cutting the program. But also, it turned out that people, the ACA Medicaid expansion is serving a function for people, including people with significant vulnerabilities that we don't think of as the group served by the Medicaid expansion in a way that, that was not understood. So uh, what's the distinction between the ACA Medicaid expansion and Medicaid that someone would get because they're on SSI? Anybody want to? Fill us in on that. Anybody, anybody, those of you that are on Twitter asking about, uh, you know, uh, this is your moment. <laughs> so one thing, every state has multiple flavors of Medicaid. And there's this saying, if you've seen one Medicaid program, you've seen one Medicaid program. That's actually itself oversimplified. If you've seen, because each state has more than one Medicaid program. And so we tend to think of the idea that if you're disabled, like my brother-in-law Vincent, you would be getting uh, Medicaid on the basis of a disability diagnosis, and you would be getting a set of services that come with that, uh, and that come usually with an SSI, receiving SSI. Well, the, well, it turns out that disability as designated in that process is a binary thing. You're either disabled or you're not. It turns out disability in the human life world that we live in is a multidimensional and continuous thing. And there's lots of people who have disabilities who, are, who need Medicaid but or who are not on it uh, through the route, through that traditional route that has the word disability on it. Why would that happen? Anybody have a sense of why that, say if you, maybe you have patients for whom this is true. Why would that happen? This is the pop quiz part of the uh, talk. What does it mean? So we'll make that a little more granular if you could. Well, over time, the definition of disability has changed, mm -hmm. evolved, expanded. Mm -hmm. so, so one thing is there's people who are marginal. Like suppose I'm a 50-year-old man. I've been laid off from my job in an unskilled. I, I, used, to be, I used to be a coal miner, and I got laid off. And I have a sore back, and I'm kind of depressed. Uh, and I'm having trouble finding work. Uh, but it's not exactly clear what's going to happen to me through that disability process. And maybe part of the reason why I've got some problems, I have some issues with OxyContin that are kind of part of it, too, because my back hurt, and I started taking prescription opioids. And what is true about addiction in terms of the disability designation in Medicaid? Anybody know? What's that? It's not, not only is it not a disability, it cannot be a contributing factor in the determination of disability. 
So anybody who's affected by the opioid epidemic, uh, they would not be on Medicaid, they cannot be on Medicaid SSI because of an opioid disorder, even if it's an obvious properly diagnosed disorder that is disabling. You could be homeless living in a homeless shelter because you have a drug addiction and alcohol problem that's very severe. You're not eligible through that route to get Medicaid. Uh, so that's, so that's, uh, that's one issue. By the way, are there some other reasons why somebody might be on Medicaid in another way? So Albert mentioned uh, the uh, one issue. What's another issue? Somebody, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's all sorts of interesting normative questions about, about what counts as a disability. And, you know, if I use a wheelchair, but I'm a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School, maybe I'm more competitive in the labor market than someone who is more, does not, ha does not need to use a wheelchair, but has, has no marketable skill in the area, in the labor market where they live. But also, I could, have, I could also have problems like I could have $10,000 in the bank, and I'm not going to meet the asset requirement. But I have very low income, and there's all kinds of reasons. So it turns out that a lot of people were using the ACA Medicaid expansion uh, bec who had genuine disabilities. And that was, that was something that Washington was late to get that memo in terms of reaching out to constituencies. The other interesting thing. Uh, is that the consumer experience in Medicaid turns out to be better than the, experiencing, the experiences many people have on the, on the Affordable Care Act state marketplaces. By the way, this has had an ambiguous impact on American politics. Uh, many people who supported President Trump in 2016 in places like West Virginia, Kentucky, one of the sources of great resentment was, I'm on this crappy insurance, whatever you call it, through Obamacare, and I, if I go to the emergency room, it's going to cost me $600. And my cousin, who everybody understands is a total screw-up, he's on Medicaid, and he can get all this stuff for free. But it's sort of an int you can imagine that that has some very interesting long-term implications for the future of American health care if people are, think that Medicaid is better than what they have. Uh, and many of the under-the-hood issues that David mentioned from a, from a patient perspective, that's not necessarily what they see. Uh, and it was also interesting, uh, I'm going to come back to this, when you talk to Republican politicians around the country, uh, there was some interesting developments around that as well, and I'll come back to that. Uh, there's also some other things that turn out to be valuable about Medicaid, and this is the part of the talk that many of my progressive friends find a little bit less comfortable. Uh, they're, uh, you know, I teach at SSA where I'm actually the right flank of the school, I think, uh, which is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the house, uh, you know, arch conservative because, uh, because I'm a liberal Democrat, but, uh, you know, but that's the, but the, the, uh, uh, the um, so, you know, Medicaid gives voice to local values and experiments, the waiver process. There's a number of aspects of Medicaid that allow different policy choices to be made and different political compromises to be made. And, you know, I often don't like what these compromises are. For example, Arkansas has put in a work requirement that in many ways is poorly designed and I consider to be cruel to people who, who end up discovering that they're kicked off a program because they failed to meet a bureaucratic requirement. Uh, and there's a lot about the work requirement that I personally would not do. But what those things do is they, I also, though, in the larger picture, I say, well, there's Arkansas, where they have a work requirement I don't like, and there's Texas, where they just did not expand ACA Medicaid at all. And if you have a stroke in Texas and you are a poor person and uninsured, you're out of luck in a lot of ways. Which do you like better? The, the work requirement that's not ideal, but that allows you to take care of people, or, or nothing? And there's a sense that, States can find a dignified political path to create bipartisan compromises through Medicaid that you can't do in Washington. You know, governors, if you're, a, if you're a member of the House of Representatives in the United States, you really don't run anything. You can basically babble like I'm doing right now with no consequence. Uh, and if you're the governor of Ohio or, or Wyoming, you can't do that. You've got a rural hospital that might close. 
you've got a bunch of real problems that you have to deal with. And, and Medicaid, there's a subtlety to allowing Medicaid to be the vehicle where these compromises are made, that's a real thing. And you know, many, many of my progressive colleagues are like, I have a two-step process for bringing about universal coverage. Step one, we achieve permanent political dominance at every level of American government. And then step two, here's what we do. You know, can we just kind of go back to step one for a second on that? Uh, Medicaid allows for s compromise in a real way. Uh, Medicaid is also the safety net for the safety net. And that was, that's also something that's very important. You know, when, anybody familiar with the Oregon health insurance experiment? How many of you have seen at least 52 talks and blog posts about the Oregon health insurance experiment? <laughs> so, one of these, the Oregon health insurance experiment found that the physical health benefits of giving someone Medicaid were, were, were real but modest. Uh, and, you know, minister to the benefit was mental health, reduced anxiety over finances, and so on. Uh, but the benefits weren't as great as one might have expected. And one reason why was that the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment, giving someone Medicaid, partially substituted for free care they were getting anyway. A very large fraction of, of uh, if the people in the control group we're getting more than 60% of the medical care of the people in the treatment group, as I recall. And so to a great extent, what the Medicaid expansion is doing is it's subsidizing the care. It's stabilizing that network that provides the care. And that is just as important as, as what the human beings see who get the care. And city, in particularly cities and counties, Medicaid is a critical thing. One of the, one of the Latent tensions in American politics when it comes to taking care of really severely disadvantaged populations is, what is the distribution of burdens between states and more local units of government, which are often the ones that are really left holding the bag to do homeless services, to do addiction treatment, and, and so on. And, and Medicaid is often stabilizing that. And you know, Cook County Health System, Medicaid expansion has been very, very important to the financing of that. Um, there, um, so we built this costly platform, and uh, so let's, uh, let me talk a little bit about what's working and what's not working in these three critical populations. Uh, criminal justice population, people who, who use drugs uh, or otherwise have substance use disorders, people with serious mental illness. And at least I'll tell you a little bit about the world that I see, and I think a lot of us in the room see different aspects of this, but that's what I see. So let's start with what we're doing right in criminal justice. First, in a place like Cook County, uh, you know, David and I are doing a, a big trial called the Supportive Release Center of people leaving uh, Cook County Jail to make sure they have a place to go if they're leaving at 1030 at night. And one of the really amazing things about Cook County Jail is almost everybody that's going through there is, is insured on Medicaid. And they do a great job, though, either they enroll them on jail entry, which is a lot easier to do than doing it when people are leaving, when it's sort of a chaotic process and people just want to get the heck out of there. Uh, you know, we do, see, we do see some people who are undocumented who are not uh, Medicaid eligible, but v very small number. And th that's quite something. And it's also striking that there's a very broad bipartisan consensus uh, that this is a good thing. And you know, I was an advocate for the Affordable Care Act when it passed. And this is really striking to me, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this one or two times again, but when, when ACA was passed, many of us were very worried that there was going to be a Willie Horton-like politics around expanding Medicaid. You know, what the ACA Medicaid expansion does is it provides health coverage to basically low-income adults who are not vets, who are not moms, who are not disabled, who are not eligible for public insurance any other way. And if you start thinking about who are the large populations of people who, who fit that description, you very quickly realize, wow, the criminal justice population is one obvious place where you're going to find a lot of people and, uh, and there was a tremendous fear that we were going to have Willie Horton leaves Cook County Jail, gets enrolled in Medicaid, and butchers a nun, and ends up on the front page of the Tribune. 
That was a very real anxiety. One of the interesting things is that, that has, Republicans have not done that at all. There have been a couple of Republican politicians around the country who've dipped their toe in trying to say that Medicaid expansion uh, is subsidizing criminals, things like that. That has not been where Republicans want to go with this. They don't feel it's a politically effective message, and it's not a message that they feel good about that they want to do in terms of their values. When you talk to Republican politicians around the country, they, most people that I've talked to say, I think it's really important that we give health insurance to people leaving the criminal justice system who have profound problems that we have to take care of. Uh, that's interesting. And actually, it turns out that David Dagan and Steve Tellis have a wonderful book on criminal justice reform called Prison Break, where they talk about how within, uh, within the deepest red states in America, there's a real groundswell of support for criminal justice reform. That's a real thing. It comes from Christian conservatives who are very motivated by the redemptive possibilities of people who are moving through the criminal justice system, who they want to assist. Uh, and it comes from libertarians who are very uh, unhappy with the idea of mass incarceration. And who's, in fact, the rhetoric of this movement has things like prison guards are bureaucrats with guns. They actually have talking points that they distribute to conservative politicians in places like Texas, South Carolina, Alabama. Uh, where they're trying to deal with some of these mass incarceration issues. Very, very important. This is not a liberal thing. They do not bring liberal policy experts in to talk to people. This is not at all the identity vouching that they want to be doing. But it's a real thing. And there's been a very strong support across the board that we have to help people going through the criminal justice system. That it speaks well of American politics. Yes. <coughs> Mark. Is it, is it done for financial reasons? or to improve the care of the incarcerated? It's funny, a little bit of both. So one of the things that's happened in a place like Texas, where, where basically conservative Republicans have, maybe they're a little nervous now with the veto thing, but they basically own the state politically, and they're saying, we could build a new prison and do a tax cut. What's interesting, by the way, is Republican politicians in the purple states are more resistant to this, because they still need the criminal justice issue as a partisan tool in the, in, as they, as they uh, fight with Democrats. In places that are solidly Republican, they really do start saying, well, how do we want to spend our money? And is this just too expensive? And uh, you know, we don't need the issue from a partisan perspective. So, um, but I think it's a very genuine thing. And it speaks to, I think to a great extent, people are motivated in a very genuine way by a sense of values that something has gone badly wrong with the criminal justice system. Uh, there, um, now, there's some things we're not doing right, uh, and some of them are obvious. Uh, we do a very poor job of uh, making sure that people actually have practical access to services. This is particularly true in jails. So, you know, there's prisons and there's jails. And basically, if you're convicted of a serious felony, you go to prison. And, and jail is much more, the, much more the place where people go before, before, you know, while their charges are being adjudicated. If they have a less serious charge, they've just been arrested. The jail is a much more fluid place, often includes people who have significant uh, uh, life challenges going on. And you know, at 26th in California, we have people who might be leaving at 10.30 at night who are at this moment of maximum personal vulnerability, and you say, who's paying attention to those people? And the answer comes back, well, nobody. And what, and what we're trying to do with the Supportive Release Center trial with TASC and Heartland is to say, can we at least give people a place to go so that we can take care of that? And I'll come back to that in a minute. Very poor attention to social determinants in Medicaid. Come back to that. Uh, and all of the ways that we, that we don't really give people access to services even when they're nominally eligible for them. And of course, in the deepest red states, uh, where there's no Medicaid expansion, uh, we, people leaving the criminal justice system are, by and large, uninsured. Uh, and, uh, and that's a particular challenge. By the way, when people who are in the criminal justice system are injured, we did a study of gun offenders. Anybody know the percentage of gun offenders that we interviewed who've been shot in their adult life? Let's just give you an idea of one aspect of this. The people we interviewed, 40%. Not, not shot at, shot. Before ACA Medicaid expansion, those people were almost always uninsured when they were shot. And some of those people were walking around with colostomy bags with, because they got emergency care when they got shot in the abdomen, but they couldn't get 
surgery uh, to get that fixed afterwards. People with people who were wearing helmets because they had missing pieces of skull and they were trying to find a physician who would who would close up the who would close that up. We don't see that after Medicaid expansion in Chicago, Detroit, the way that we the way that we did 10 years ago. Uh, but we do see that in Houston, Miami, uh, places where uh, uh, where they don't do the Medicaid expansion. Uh, another challenge we have is just is just bureaucratic siloing that we decouple correctional health care from Medicaid. So when you come into the healthcare into the correctional health care system, you are you are disenrolled in Medicaid, and the services that you get in that setting are paid for in a totally different way, and then you have to be reconnected to Medicaid when you leave. And guess what? There's all kinds of problems with that process in terms of continuity of care and, and so on. And so we've created a real uh, transitional nightmare uh, with that. And, uh, and many people are trying to improve that, that process. But it's uh, Arizona actually has a Medicaid waiver where they're trying to do all their correctional care through Medicaid, which would be a much better system. Uh, the federal government doesn't like that because basically it would have to pay uh, the federal match for, for the correctional care. Uh, just one of the predictable issues that we have, when people leave prison, they have an incredibly high risk of death. The risk, the adjusted mortality rate in the first two weeks leaving a correctional setting is about 12 times that of the general population. The two most common uh, causes of excess mortality are homicide and opioid overdose. And I'll come back to that. But there's a famous study by Binswanger and colleagues. So, uh, uh, so people are precisely at the moment when they're between systems, they're at the maximum vulnerability. Uh, so let me say some things about addiction. Again, there's some surprising things that we're doing right. Uh, one, so I mentioned the Willie Horton anxiety around the criminal justice process, there was the same anxiety that advocates for the Affordable Care Act had about addiction and mental health parity. And there was a whole, in fact, the addiction community, while the Affordable Care Act was being formulated, developed a whole political strategy about how to, how to present addiction uh, in the political process as ACA was being debated. And they go to the Senate Finance Committee, and every Republican votes for all of the addiction and mental health measures in the Affordable Care Act, including the ones, they, they, these are all people who voted against the Affordable Care Act in its final bill, but they all voted for the substance use and mental health parity components. That never became a controversial issue in ACA in a really striking way. Part of it was that President George W. Bush had made important contributions to mental health parity. Uh, it turns out that, that substance use and mental health parity is, a core, is kind of a core principle of American politics right now. Whether it's actually implemented is another question. Uh, but we assume that, we, many of us uh, were overly pessimistic about, about what the values were in the American political process. It seems like everyone that you talk to has a cousin or a spouse or themselves have had issues like this. And the conversation in American politics is much more humane than it was, for example, during the crack epidemic 25 years ago. By the, the Part of the issue is that we also do not have a large amount of drug-related crime in America right now. It certainly exists, but it's not. There's no fear of massive crime, and that has a big impact on the way people think and talk about these issues. People think about people involved in the opioid epidemic as people who need help, not people who are going to punch me in the face to try to steal my backpack. And that matters. Uh, the, um, uh, and one of the things that I... I uh, uh, I'll get to in a minute. I've been talking to policymakers around the country, and it's really striking how when states were debating should we expand Medicaid after the ACA, the addiction component became a feature, not a bug, from the point of view of many Republican politicians around the country. Uh, we should expand Medicaid because it will help us with the addiction issues we're facing as a state. Uh, that was uh, very important. And that was totally the opposite of what many of us expected in how this conversation was going to go. Uh, there's some evidence that Medicaid expansion promotes more integrated care. Tom Diano and I published some papers where we found that there were more integrated care arrangements that involved specialty addiction providers in states that expanded Medicaid than in other states. 
there's also a lot of evidence that states that didn't expand Medicaid that just people with addiction disorders have a much harder time getting treatment. Uh, things that we're not doing so well now, uh, getting to David's point, uh, the under the hood aspects of Medicaid uh, really strongly influence access and quality and are not done very well in many states. Uh, many, very few states cover the full range of evidence-based care. If you look, for example, at the American Society of Addiction Medicine and the continuum of care that they identify, very few states cover the full gamut the way that it would be nice if they did. Uh, the other aspect I don't think has gotten nearly enough attention, but I'm worried about for the future, which is where we have this, the, everything that everybody is doing right now with Medicaid and addiction is being framed by the opioid epidemic. If you talk to anyone within five minutes, they will start talking about the number of people who've died of opioid overdose in their state and how they're on fire to try to reduce that number. Uh, and the Trump administration, Congress, every state, every interest group is saying, we got to do something to stop people from dying. You know, we have 72,000 people died last year of drug overdose. That's way worse than HIV at its peak. It's way worse than gun homicide. If you add it onto AIDS at its peak, it's unbelievably bad. But there's a problem that that's framing everything. And you know, there's a lot of different kinds of addiction issues that people have. And, uh, and if we start rewiring how we do residential addiction treatment based on the needs of opioid, people with opioid disorders, for example, it's not at all clear that that is the right way to do it when people have alcohol disorders or serious mental illnesses that require residential care who just have different needs. And I think we're going to discover that we're making some big policy mistakes because of that coincidence. And in a way, it's been, it's been generative that people are so, there's a humane conversation about the opioid epidemic. That's good. But I think a lot of the details we're going to get wrong for other kinds of addiction disorders because we're so focused on that. Uh, and the open epidemic, by the way, should also say it's just really hard. I think if we had absolutely excellent policies and interventions that were everything that everyone asked for, we would still have tens of thousands of Americans dropping dead every year from this thing. And I, that's just a reality. It's just a really, really hard problem. And it's not, uh, it's not one that, if you put me in charge of it, that I feel I could just I could just solve it. I was actually on an NIH study section two weeks ago, called the, something called the HEAL intervention, where states were asked to submit huge grants. Each grant was maybe $120 million level. And the, you, you had to promise that you would reduce opioid mortality by 40% in three years. And when I was reading these applications, my thought was zero of these applications are going to, they're excellent applications, but zero of them are going to reduce opioid mortality by 40%. That's just. You know, I, I just don't see that we know how to do that. Uh, some things that we're, uh, that, that I just want to mention in the two hours that I've left. The, um, so one is, one of the real challenges we have with addiction is the way that we separate personal health services from public health. And this is really a big problem in addiction in a couple of different ways. One is that we need to do a lot of harm reduction. In the context of HIV prevention, that would be syringe support programs, giving out sterile syringes, things like that. Medicaid typically does not pay for that. Case finding, uh, distributing naloxone to prevent overdose, those things tend to be quite separate from Medicaid and, they're, and therefore quite separate from the health services that Medicaid pays for. So if you go into addiction treatment, they really need to be giving you an extensive package of overdose prevention supports partly giving you naloxone in case you relapse when you're, we have some continued level of use, partly uh, to connect you with a local service provider who can help you with the issues that you might have. That's not really happening. Uh, there's also, there are ways that addiction is stigmatized. It's harder to get transportation supports, for example, if you want to get to addiction treatment than it is if you have other kinds of health problems uh, that, um, uh, where you might need transportation to a health care provider. And also uncertainty about Medicaid's future. When we talk to addiction uh, programs, one of the things that we hear is we're afraid to take full advantage of what Medicaid offers right now because it's such a politically volatile issue. And so we are worried that if we expand services, that what will happen is we will end up putting down a lot of fixed costs, and then Congress will cut Medicaid, and we will be stuck. And, and that's a big. Uh, 
Uh, and that's a big challenge that people, uh, where political polarization makes it hard to, on the ground, do the things that people would like to do. What we've seen so far with the Medicaid expansion is programs are, there's less of an expansion of overall capacity than there is an expansion in just programs being paid for things they're already doing. And they're waiting to, for the dust to settle politically. Uh, just some work that we've, this is actually Brendan Solaner and Colleen Berry and, and Ken Stoller looked across states and found states vary dramatically in what their Medicaid programs cover. And amazingly enough, the states that generously cover methadone maintenance, a much higher percentage of people with opioid disorders are actually enrolled in medication assisted treatment, which is the evidence based treatment. Many states do not cover methadone or do not cover methadone properly in, in a generous way. And you see many more people are outside of the treatment system in those places. Uh, one in 20 justice referred adults in specialty treatment for opioid use receive methadone or buprenorphine. This is terrible. You know, this is basically, this is, this is the standard of care, and almost no one who is getting justice-referred treatment is getting the proper treatment right now uh, through these vehicles. Uh, and uh, when we looked across states, this is from a health affairs article uh, that uh, Colleen Grogan's the first author on uh, from our NDATS group. Uh, we found basically the blue states cover a lot, the red states cover less, Notice, by the way, blue and red does not match the political blue and red. Texas, you see, they cover quite a bit, uh, whereas uh, uh, some of the states that are hardest hit, uh, like Kentucky, are really lagging behind in, in just covering what people need. Uh, so it's not enough to just cover addiction treatment. You have to cover the treatment that works for the, the person's condition. Uh, so some more on the end. That's fine. We did find a. The major story is the differences between the expansion and non-expansion states. The biggest thing that we found under the hood when you mentioned managed care is the places that required prior authorization for buprenorphine treatment, units were much less likely to offer that kind of treatment. They just did not want to deal with Medicaid to get the prior authorization. A patient would call up and say, I, I, I really think I should be on Suboxone, which is buprenorphine. Uh, and the, the units would be like, it's just too much hassle to deal with Medicaid around that issue, and they're just not doing it. Uh, so, uh, so we did find an expansion of services, but an incomplete expansion. So I'm getting near, uh, I'm, I'm getting down there. Hang in there with me. Uh, we also found that it mattered quite a bit whether there were uh, physicians who were equipped to prescribe the treatments that people need. The places that had a good supply of physicians, this is actually a paper that I did with, uh, with Hufei Wen and Jason Hockenberry. We found that uh, when there's buprenorphine wavered physicians, it's a lot easier to get Medicaid services for people than otherwise. Uh, there, uh, and we did find uh, many, many restrictions on Medicaid that percolated through to patients. And I think that the bottom line is really that prior authorization of services is the key constraint that we found in Medicaid. This is Christina Andrews, who's, who's uh, the first author on a lot of these papers. Uh, uh, it was quite striking how, how important that aspect of Medicaid was. In fact, uh, you know, if, if you show up and you're a cash-paying patient, they might be more willing to deal with you. Did you have a question, Mark? The, um, so let me get on to serious mental illness, just in case you're not depressed enough uh, with everything else I've been telling you. Many of the same issues come up uh, with SMI, and many people with SMI are, are in different types of Medicaid. And that was some of the people protesting. This is a protest during the ACA repeal. People with serious mental illness kind of were in the background compared to the people using wheelchairs from, from the optics point of view. But a lot of people with facing mental illness issues were very concerned about the repeal. Uh, the, um, the, by the way, this was a group that was called Not Dead Yet, which is one of the greatest advocacy names ever. Um, there, um, uh, so some things that we're not doing so well. Uh, housing is a big one. People, a lot of people with serious mental illness need help with housing. And they need to have integrated care within the medical care system, but also between the medical care system and other sectors. And I'm going to spend the last, the last 10 minutes of my talk laying out some of that. Uh, so, you know, I, a lot of us who cover Medicaid a long time uh, 
I've always been wondering, can't we find housing? Wouldn't that be so much more cost effective for so many people who keep showing up in the emergency room, for example? And you know, David and I are involved in some interventions around that. You did... Can I ask you a question? Yeah. You had a bullet on two slides ago that I think is relevant. For this. this one? Yeah. Assumption that all evidence of SMI or SSI may rather unsure. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I mean, I, I, I got service right now. So I mean, seeing this, you sort of meet someone, you kind of guess based on what you know about their medical history, about whether they're, you know, on SS, SSI. Like I'm surprised a lot. And um, yeah. and you know, I understand there are multiple sides to this, but it's interesting because once you're on SSI, like you got it, um, you you're you're suddenly insured by. Right? Well, well, SSDI would get you the Medicare. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, at least for the SSDI, I guess that's what I'm more of my question mark wants to. Okay. Like, 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 they have, like, pretty decent insurance as things go. Yeah. You know, everything's paid better. Yeah. They also have Medicaid co-payments. We have to Medicaid eligible. Like, yeah. It's really not, not bad. And, and, and I, so I, I'm wondering, is, is part of this that we're we're not managing the transition to to SSDI well, and, and and what part of it is, and then then you know occasionally also you 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 honestly meet people not so much in the hospital I find but in the clinic yeah. who are on disability and you kind of wonder why they're there yeah. and yeah. Um, how they got there. My experience with a few of them is that they're actually pretty high functioning people who just haven't figured out a way to get the system to work pretty well for them. Mm. So, so like, you know, there, there are problems on both sides. Well, the, uh, you identified, so, oh, I'm sorry. No, I said there are problems mm. on both sides of this, but mm. I just wonder how much, you know, when we think about what's wrong or right about Medicaid, particularly in this population, the issue isn't maybe only just or even so much Medicaid. But the other programs that Medicaid surrounds and, and how we're managing that. Well I, well, I think that last point is so on target because Medicaid is basically the safety net for every other program. And in the context of SSDI, the major way that it is is when you qualify for SSDI, once you get on the program, there's a two year waiting period to get Medicare. During that time, that's when many people suffer the most punishing financial consequences of disability. And that two-year waiting period made some sense in the pre-ACA era when uh, there, was, there was a sort of moral hazard issue around disability insurance and a, and a desire for, for private disability insurance to pick up some of these costs. But very often, uh, people, when they first get on SSDI, they, you know, they have to wait two years to get Medicare. There are, there, it's complicated. SSDI is a very complicated program, but that's a big, that's a big challenge. And there are, there certainly are people on, who are ambiguous cases in SSDI. Uh, and um, uh, so there's a, that's no question. That's a real, there's a real set of issues there. And to the extent we can decouple the health insurance question from the financial assistance question also, that would of course be better. The, um, uh, so, but I, so I, I, I did some work in Chicago here where I, again, I did some work. By the way, those of you that know that I'm interested in personal finance would love that I've got this uh, annuities ad up on the corner, which I take no responsibility for. The, um, uh, so the people that are sort of the friendly faces who keep showing up. Uh, so I, I went up to, to uh, Uptown and I talked to some folks who live in supportive housing. So this is a man named Haywood who, uh, is uh, had a whole series of medical challenges, and uh, and his entire life was stabilized when he was put into an apartment that costs like eight hundred dollars a month, and it, he's now his grandchildren come and visit him, he's got a refrigerator to hold his medicine, uh, his life was transformed. That's his caseworker uh, from from Heartland there, who's a wonderful person. Uh, here's another lady, Antonia, who had some similar issues. Uh, and, uh, and supportive housing was just fantastic for her in many ways stabilizing her condition. And, and ended up being much cheaper because she was much, you know, her healthcare utilization really stabilized when her life stabilized. Uh, 
The ability to have a, your own private space to be if you have a serious mental illness and you might be dysregulated every now and then is incredibly important. You just have a private space to be so that no one's, you're not freaking out other people or getting into conflicts, whatever, you can retreat, have some privacy. So uh, Steve Brown, many of you know, uh, over at UIC is doing a lot of work to try to house what are sometimes called the super utilizers, uh, the various names for folk. And, uh, and it's a wonderful program in a lot of ways. Uh, where you say, basically, you've, you keep showing up at our emergency department, we're spending a fortune, why don't we just find you an apartment? And maybe that's cheaper. And, and we're doing some work with some of the high flyers type people who get involved with police a lot. And uh, so this is, there's nothing more beautiful than a galley proof. This came yesterday. And, you know, there's, is there anything more beautiful? You know, the thing actually comes out and the world can, planet continues to rotate. You know, you sort of get so excited when you see the galley proof. The, you know, you expect that this is going to be transformational. But we, we were tracking people who had repeated 911 calls where police were involved and, and ambulance. And, and we actually tried to identify people's risks that they had. And there were risks that they had because of their person-level risks. There were event type of risks that people had, like on check day somebody's calling because there's a dispute between an SSDI recipient and their payee, or um, there's place-based risks. You know, there's hot spots, like the train stations, where there's a lot of calls. And we also found there are things that are, we call them harm spots after Larry Sherman, or risk spots. Maybe there's a private home where there's someone who lives there where there's significant challenges. There might be 911 calls. Most of the people that are our frequent customers are Medicaid recipients. And you know, we're trying to help improve policies to help that group in a lot of ways. One of the striking things is how the healthcare system and the emergency first response system don't really interdigitate. Interdigitate, I can say that word. Uh, so here, I, Ruth Tentner, I just asked her if she would map up all the group homes in Chicago where there had been that type of 911 call, and we just made this map. As far as I know, no one else has ever made this map. Uh, so if you, get a, if you are a first responder in Chicago, you get a call, come to this address. Something's happening at this address. You don't actually, you're, you're very often coming cold to that. You don't know that there's a person who lives in that home who's deaf. I've exhausted everybody. Hey, Harold, thanks for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask, so you talked about the bipartisanship support of Medicaid, especially at the state level with governors. I was wondering if you could share your opinion on what's going on in Utah um, and the political aspect there. So Utah passed a referendum which basically increased Medicaid expansion. Many states, by the way, have done Medicaid expansion so far, put it on a on ballot initiative that we passed. The state legislature has dramatically constrained that in a couple of two ways. One is the things like work requirements, and the second is ACA Medicaid expansion is supposed to go up to 138% of the property line, and we're going to do that with the other one. And Utah wants to only go to 100%. So the good thing about that is that, is that over 100% you can get into the ACA market. It saves the state some money. You can get money in 148, won't get Medicaid on the, on the state exchange. There's two bad things about it. One is that uh, it's not what the ballot is. It's distorting what the ballot initiative has passed. It makes the risk pool in the state market place. And I think one of the long-term consequences of that will be that it that it makes health insurance more expensive for a lot of people. Because the, the, the Medicaid population that goes into the exchange back and forth is the least healthy population in the state market process. So it turns out that in the states that didn't expand Medicaid, health insurance premiums in the marketplace were something like eight to eleven percent higher than they would be in the state expanded. So they're, they're damaging the risk pool some. I think the fact that Utah, one of the most Republican states in the country, is expanding is still a good thing. And uh, so I, it's one of those things where I would have preferred that they had that, but I'll take that over to Texas any day of the week. <coughs> I do think that the, that the fact that the states of the former Confederacy have 90% of the people shut out of the Medicaid 
expansion? Yeah, if you actually look at the US map, it looks like there's a bunch of states all over the country. But the notion is that human beings affect all southeastern United States. The fact that Montana and Wyoming might be doing whatever it's doing, it's just there's a lot of cows there. Uh, the, um, I do think the next time around, Democrats are just going to say, we're not going to bother with expanding Medicaid uh, for basic health insurance uh, because we don't trust the government's so in states that did expand Medicaid and where people can now get into Medicaid without an asset test, but those same states didn't actually do anything to remove the asset test from their disability provisions, how does that actually get implemented? It seems crazy. Well, it is crazy. Uh, one of the, the, the Medicaid countable asset limit is $2,000. If you just imagine how you're supposed to live with that constraint, it's crazy. By the way, did anyone know when that $2,000 was set at $2,000? A long time. 1989. The, it was $1,500 more than 40 years ago. So that it is a huge, huge problem because, because people with serious disabilities very often, the ACA Medicaid expansion does not cover the long-term services that support the provider of the And so there's punishing asset requirements cause tremendous hardship to people. And Andrea Campbell has a book about her sister-in-law in California. Her sister-in-law became a paraplegic and, and was just what you bring in the bluest state in America because of those kinds of problems. And uh, ultimately, ACA was a tremendous lost opportunity to deal with some of these disability issues. And we did a program that failed in the class and actually was supposed to help with that. And they could have raised that asset requirement and dealt with the SSDI waiting for the new things. But I mean, if, if you get into Medicaid, without the assets, in a state where there's no asset test because they expanded Medicaid, and you then use the Medicaid provisions that help pay for nursing home care or whatever. Right now, the states still have the right to come, to come after you for, um, I forget, the, the word is not reimbursement, but it's, uh, yeah. So does, the, does, does this actually happen? So what's it going to take to fix our blue states, red state approach to, to Medicaid? Uh, is, there, is there really a solution in the offing? We've got a, a changing governor who certainly talks a good talk, uh, but what's it going to take to actually move us uh, off of what we do with Medicaid in, in the state of Illinois? That's a very good question. Uh, I think we have to be, I think we have to be open about some of the issues that David mentioned, that things actually have to work. And there is, a, we accept a mediocre quality of governance around a lot of issues that doesn't work. And, uh, and it's a bipartisan issue, uh, and it goes, uh, um, and all of us who rely on this system see them every day. Uh, I think that in the intellectual disability space, our current ranking is 44 or 47. Uh, and, um, and I think that that we have, I think as a state, that we have, it, this will be a much longer conversation, but I think that part of it's around revenue, and part of it's around government's reform. And I think every fiscal, everything in the state constitution that refers to fiscal policy problems or in some way work it on. We need significantly, we, when I say significantly more revenue, we need more revenue on the two, the two percentage points that states annually for permanent revenue increase to finance our current obligations. Uh, and when you, when you basically make it hard to have a progressive income tax, you deal with the pension issue, and the 
distinction, and obviously it's a challenge. Um, the, um, I think the disability advocacy community has to put a, has to pressure um, this data going to make it better. Um, it's, uh, I think I'm optimistic that uh, the topics hopefully will uh, go in the one good thing is that we're, our, our services are so bad that we have such support supervision that's preventing the quality of problems in the university. We had no budget for two years. I was so relieved that all the emotions of the services in the state of the state So uh, it didn't matter what the program and legislature were doing, which was probably good. Uh, the, um, um, I do think when I look at the both of them, Really strange. When I talk to people in Ohio and New Hampshire, uh, people who are very ambivalent about the aspects of marriage, they're saying, you know, we have to give people that we know who are being served by these programs the desperately and cut through the vocal, low quality of governance and the partisan organization. Key leaders in both parties and parties are saying, how do we make this work? I would find a politically dignified path to the, my constituency for the And that's why, I, unlike some of my friends, like I'm more receptive, even though I'm totally against the work requirement, things like that, I think are sometimes essential because they, they create a dignified path. And in Illinois, we may need some things like that. And uh, something so that a broad range of stakeholders. So in Ohio, the, the pro life community. Very important role in the Medicaid expansion. Saying, so, you know, we want we want people to know that if they're pregnant, that they will have access to health coverage, and that they do not need to terminate the pregnancy because they are afraid that they will not their child health needs will not be met, their health needs will not be met. I thought that was great for me to create that kind of human coalition where the deep value disagreements would also deep value alignments that we can make that. At least at the state level, you have some, you have some hope that we only do that. Uh, but I think in Illinois here, we need to prove, you know, we've got a big, we've got a lot of history to overcome. So that's my bad one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in regards to the housing issue, do you happen to know if there have been any uh, further effort, efforts to um, incentivize, either at the federal or state level, uh, private property owners to participate in the Section 8 program or any other program in order to offer low-cost housing to um, the homeless? There are some great, it is a pretty innovative space. People are trying to do social impact bonds, for example. Try to incentivize that. It's very complicated in space because there's so many flavors of, of housing from Section 8, and then supportive housing, and back to the um, It is, um, uh, we have one asset going for us here in our numbers, and at least it's not a really big thing. The big policy failure of the big, big, big wealthy of the city is that they just, they just don't put really enough housing. Super expensive. And here in Chicago, we can't physically provide housing in an economical way. Uh, it's not it's not ridiculously expensive. If you go if you go to a place and you go online and you can if you need some information, you can involve supportive housing. The physical housing is quite economical. But I think we're going to have to really experiment a lot. I don't think it's going to be one of these things. I think Medicaid will play a big role in that because the niches of what Medicaid will pay for housing. That will be much easier to do than just here's somebody who's really poor who needs section in housing. Because there's just uh, there's a huge need for that. And, uh, that's, and then your section 8 is the value of a section 8 value is much more, for example, than the value of a 10 on the So that's, that's where you get into serious money and where People's sense of worthy versus unworthy poor comes into the mix too, because 
there is a sense that people who need housing because they have a special need for it has a much easier way to live than people who are not here yet as a society. I wish we could get there. I'm happy to be capable of anything. Those of you that have to go, I'm all for the purpose of the